Listen, and thank all of you for coming. And I like Jim Fry's answer. He says, Ro, I can't believe it. Me pay seven dollars to hear you talk. And I said, Jim, I can't believe you would either on that basis. But tonight what I thought I'd do is just give some reflections and some thoughts about Michigan political history, particularly centered around Lansing area. And it's really been kind of interesting because I've always looked at, and I've visited now all the capitals in the country, and it's really kind of unique because Lansing's a unique city, because we got a late start. And Lansing has to be perhaps the most unhistoric of all the capitals in America. And I don't say that negatively, I'm just saying there isn't really the history associated with Lansing uh, that there is with most capitals around the country. And when we started out uh, with our capital, you know, we were, when we became a state in 1837, um, our capital was located in Detroit from 1837 to 1847. And um, in fact, if you ever want to see the location, it's called Old Capitol Park. And in, at Old Capitol Park, you'll find there's a statue of Stevens T. Mason, Michigan's boy governor. And um, uh, Mason, years later, uh, about uh, 75 years later, there was a movement, uh, and we went to, there was a group that went to Virginia and brought the remains of Stevens Mason from Virginia, and they were transplanted underneath the statue in Capitol Park. And the location of Capitol Park would be where the old Greyhound bus depot is in Detroit. And that's where Michigan's first capital was. Well, folks, uh, Lansing is the capital city that started with the highest of politics and simply because there was no community here. And um, you talk about politics really moving, and that was to get uh, the capital out of Detroit. And when it was first named in Detroit, it was only to be a short period of time, about 10 to 12 years, and they said, we're going to move it out of state. One of the early rationales was that it was too close to the Canadian border, and therefore wasn't safe should we have another war, and that was a feed off of the, the War of 1812 and, and that period in there. And so they started the, the game of deciding <laughs> where should the capital be. And it's fun being on the History Commission. I, get such, I had such a kick out, I spent 20 years on the History Commission. And it was funny because wherever I would travel in Michigan, they would say, well, you know, Lincoln stayed here. When Lincoln came to Michigan, you know, he stayed here and would have you. Well, folks, the only time uh, Lincoln ever set foot in Michigan was one time, and that's when he was a surrogate for John C. Fremont, and he came to Kalamazoo, stayed overnight, and uh, gave the famous boiling pot speech, and turned around and went back. Never once set foot. The closest was the closest he came was he went up the Detroit River during the Black Hawk War, when he was a captain of the Black Hawk War, and he went up the Detroit River and went over into Canada. That's about as close as it came. Well, it's about like Michigan. Every town when I was on the Michigan History Commission, you know, Jerry, uh, <clears throat> you probably don't realize this, but we were considered uh, very definite as a possibility for the capital. And I said, oh, thank you. Yes, you were. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, that's even when they mentioned that to me up at Eagle River in Kiwana County. <laughs> so, but anyway, they wanted to move it to more of the center part of the state. And so the politics really started. And you, the determination was to be made in the legislature. And there were very, there were a number of communities that really wanted it. You had just a ton of them. But it came down basically to two. One of the hottest arguments was to move to Marshall. And Marshall almost had it until the Midnight Caucus, and it was reversed. And then the two cities that really competed for it would have been Marshall and, by the way, Bob, the judge, would have been DeWitt. So our capital could have been DeWitt. When they picked Lansing, there was nothing here. And they literally had to come in and cut out the land and to build and to put up a state capital here. And that's why. Lansing is known as a city in the forest. If you'll find the city in the forest. And that's what Lansing was known as. So they had to come in literally when you, you read the stories of early day history where they have wooden planks that would people would walk on to be able to survive and people getting sunk in the mud and everything else. It was an absolute mess. And as you know, the first capital stood on the site where the old Woolworth building uh, was. That's where we have the very first one. And then, of course, 1879, we have the present capital that we have. But the politics were really great, and they wanted it, and Marshall had such support, and then they threw into it, and they did a compromise, and they said, there will be no politics if we pick a neutral spot. And so they picked 
Parliament. And as you know, that's what caused basically Lansing Township to become a what, non contiguous township in five different parcels. And there are only two or three like that. In other words, if you look at Lansing Township, you'll find it on Waverly, on South Waverly. Then you go out um, by AAA in that area. Um, there are five portions of uh, Lansing Township that are not connected. Well, if you don't think that wasn't a problem, then they really had to work with Lansing Fire Department, Lansing Police Department, who covers which crimes, when and where. And um, so the Lansing Police Department was covering half of the thing, so they've now worked out a deal almost by address. And unless it's a major crime, the Lansing Police Department doesn't cover it, unless it's a shooting or robbery or something in that area. And then they work on a payback basis. But Lansing started out on a very, very political basis. And the unique people that played such a role in it. Because of that, Lansing has had all kinds of politics, but it's an interesting thing. We have never had an individual from Lansing, Michigan, be elected governor of the state. Not one. We've only had one U.S. senator come out of Lansing, and he really, because he was on the Supreme Court when he ran judge, and you might recall, and that was uh, uh, Judge Christensen. But Judge Christensen's residence was Monroe, but he happened to be on the bench when he ran for the Senate. So that's kind of interesting. Here's the capital city, and we cross Waverly, and we go into Eaton County, and we've had two governors. You had Fitzgerald, um, that um, it was it was interesting, and then you had uh, Dickinson, who lived in Charlotte, and so you had those two. And Dickinson uh, was Fitzgerald's uh, lieutenant governor, became governor when he died. And it was always fun. You guys remember the restaurant downtown on Michigan Avenue called Jim's Tiffany Lounge? Mm -hmm. They used to brag so much about all the governors of Michigan came and have eaten here, except one. And that was uh, Governor Dickinson. Governor Dickinson was on uh, the ballot with four different governors. And the reason why he was on the ballot is he always represented the, pro the prohibition interests. And to get that block of voters, they always put Dickinson on the ballot. Well, Dickinson wasn't about uh, to uh, come to an establishment that served alcoholic beverages. I mean, that would just be above him. He did, however, and he was 80 when he was running for election, but he did like to chase the ladies around the table mm -hmm. on that basis. He had a lot of zip work, sort of like a strong throat. But it was interesting on the makeup of some of the people. Lansing became the center for all kinds of political activity. But you have to remember that when Lansing became the center, it wasn't like a full life occupation to be governor or in the legislature. Uh, the sessions were very, very brief. And I know the great story of uh, one of the early governors, Hazen Pingree, um, potato, good old potato, uh, Pingree they called him. And he was the mayor of Detroit, and he got very upset. Oh, he hated Lansing, absolutely hated it. And his second term of governor, he said, we're going to move the capital back to Detroit, or we're going to move to Grand Rapids. I haven't been able in four years to get a bath in this town. These people, they're animals. I mean, he said they're parasites. I mean, he just blasted it. And when he, got, when he was mayor of Detroit and he was governor, he would not give up the mayorship of Detroit. He said, I can be both. And it took the legislature to say, you can't. He would sign, the first bills they ever signed said, he's an S. Pingree, mayor of Detroit and governor of the state of Michigan is how he did it. And uh, I think it's, it's really kind of funny on his attitude. Well, finally they said, no, he spent, he, he, hard, he would hardly come to Lansing, his second term as governor. He did all his business in Detroit. He'd come up and give the major state of the state, and then he'd go home, and uh, he was really a feisty old duck. He was a Maine, he was from Maine, and uh, moved to, um, that's when he moved to Massachusetts and became an authority, you know, he became a shoemaker, and that was, he's in Pinbury Shoe Company. And uh, he served in the Civil War, and it was interesting. He's the only Michigan governor to have uh, been in Andersonville prison. And, but he did not like Lansing whatsoever. But governors would come up and would have probably the guy that used Lansing as a base as much as anybody and really accomplished a great deal was the man whose statue is in front of the state capitol, Austin Blair. Austin Blair was one of the most unique human beings I think I've ever met in all political history. The guy was an absolute classic, and as you know, he was Michigan's Civil War governor. And he was, uh, he had lived, uh, uh, he's buried in Jackson with his three wives. Uh, back then, two of them died automatically when they both had children. 
and they both died in childbirth and the kids died. He had a rough life. And he was also county clerk of Eaton County and he used to walk from uh, uh, Eaton Rapids up to Charlotte twice a year when he conducted business. That's how often they conducted business. And so he moved up um, and whatever. But he was lasting as a base and he raised money for the 1st Michigan Volunteer Infantry. He got all kinds of support from Lansing people and he raised over $100,000. And remember, this unit, the 1st Michigan, that had tons of people from Lansing, and he heralded it as one of the great ones, and um, uh, one of the great units was the second unit to go into the Civil War. The 6th Massachusetts was the first, and Michigan was the first uh, military unit from the West. And Lincoln made that famous statement um, God, uh, thank God for the Michiganders. And that's why we use that term, Michigander, versus Michiganian, is based on what Lincoln had said. Now, rightfully or not, you know, it uh, was on that basis, but uh, he served two terms, and uh, he was a real maverick. He did not like Rutherford B. Hayes, and he didn't like Grant. And he bolted and uh, uh, supported Democrat candidates those, that, those two years and uh, then ended up getting elected University of Michigan Regent. And, uh, but he sort of liked the Michigan thing. Michigan, uh, Lansing, Michigan, as you know, the first year was known as Michigan, Michigan. And then they finally came up and named it Lansing because of New York, the city of New York, or some people say it was after General Lansing, or it was after the city, and everything I determined it was after the city. So they had some politics based on that. And since that time, when we look over the period of years, this has always been the center of all the activity politically. It was pulled away from Detroit, particularly in the 30s, in the early years. Because the most interesting thing when I said that Lansing never had a governor or a senator, Detroit, as far as, if I recall, had something like only three in the history. We only had three from Detroit. All the governors came from very small communities. And it was just really interesting. We had uh, all kinds of political activity. Even, I remember 1948 story, I don't know if somebody, anybody saw the biography on Betty Ford last night. Did anybody happen to catch that? It's interesting, she said, when I got married and Jerry was running for uh, election in the general election, 1948, she said, I remember where we spent our honeymoon, in Owasso, okay. <laughs> when Tom Dewey made his announcement for president. And that's where Dewey made his second announcement. He always went back to Owasso. So again, here's a small town where somebody came from. Uh, probably the most uh, famous person in politics that we've had is probably President Ford, who was from Grand Rapids on that basis. And uh, in the Capitol, we do have a picture of the president. Uh, but here's a guy who had no experience in politics prior to running, ran as a congressman, then became president. Uh, as you know, we've had uh, all kinds. Lansing has always been really the center. Uh, you look at the politics. Uh, remember the famous Wentworth Hotel fire where we lost nine legislators, ten legislators, and uh, because they'd stay overnight. And, uh, pardon me? Kearns Hotel. I meant Kearns. I'm sorry, Kearns. I meant Kearns. Sorry about that. I'm always thinking the Wentworth and Kearns, they were close together. The Kearns Hotel fire. I dedicated the marker for it, too. I want you to know for the Kearns. And we did it in the lobby of the Radisson Hotel, which is a no-no. You know, hotels and fires. Um, I was there. Yeah, you were there. Oh, yes. You remember we had the fire engine outside? And, oh, yes. And we did all of those things. That was just great. But Lansing has always had it, and the Republicans and the Democrats, when uh, Lansing played a major role in Ingham County as such, in the founding of the Republican Party. It was formed July 6, 1854 in Jackson. And if you remember uh, uh, some of the Brown family, Jim Brown, who had been a state representative, his father, Vernon Brown, had been lieutenant governor, and Vernon Brown's father had marched all the way from Mason to Jackson, and people all met. There were some key Lansing people in the formation of the party. And uh, it's interesting, when we look at all the politics, the judge would know this very well, where all the people, they would pick certain locations, would be kind of the watering holes when you would come to Lansing. The Democrats had their special place, and the Republicans had their special place. Now it's, uh, it's still a little confused because there are so many places that they kind of spread out. But for years and years, it was always the Capitol Park Hotel where the Democrats would hang out, and then it would be the Jack Tar Hotel where the Republicans hung out. Now it seems to be kind of a consensus that the majority of them all go to the nightcap, which holds about 85 people. 
but it gets pretty powerful. Still, some of the some will go to the Capitol Park, but not much anymore. And so they spread out. So all the activities were centered. The governors uh, who lived here, this is kind of interesting that <coughs> most governors have overnight accommodations because they were only here for a short time. But uh, you had uh, people who lived here full time. And Williams lived both in the home over down by the State Journal. He lived there, and then he lived up uh, by the gardens uh, uh, over by Oldsmobile. He had a home up there. Um, so he spent more time here probably than most governors, was the first governor to spend a great deal. Um, the other governor is one I like to think about who kept Costa checks in business. You know who that is? The governor that Costa checks in business. They Kim were, Sigler. Kim Sigler. And Kim Ziegler was probably the best dressed governor in the history of all time. He was the second governor to fly an airplane after uh, much to his chagrin. Uh, much to his chagrin, because that's how he ended his life. But he had, they guesstimated, anywhere up to 200 suits. And if you, were, if you came into him, you were a client, and if you didn't have any money or something, uh, he had like clothing stores or something like this, he had businesses just give him suits and things like this. The guy was incredible. And that was Kim Ziegler. And, but when you got into the residences, when um, I know looking back, Swainson lived over on Apple Tree Lane, over just across the Delta Township, and he had a home. He was raising a family at the time. And uh, then you got in when Romney got elected, lived in East Lansing, and then um, just right. I'm trying to think of the street. Lenore, pardon me. Lenore, did you? No, George Romney. Lenore lived. They had a home that they rented in East Lansing. Milliken lived uh, when he was lieutenant governor in Pine Forest because it was Romney where we first got the governor's residence. And that was the Howard Sober Mansion. And the Howard Sober Mansion, as you know, gained great acclaim, fame in uh, the nation for one little episode. You guys remember what that episode was? I think it was on Christmas Eve, 1965 is when they raided Howard Sober's home for the gambling. And that's where they got Sober and the famous baseball pitcher from Holland, Dizzy Dean, remember? Dizzy Dean, and that was the fame. And the, uh, the, uh, the this is a great story. The US attorney that was in charge of that raid was Jim Bricker, was the one who was in charge of that. Well, they negotiated and everything else, and they finally purchased that residency. And um, Howard Sober donated it. No. He raised money, I thought. He took a tax break on it. Yeah, but let me, let me tell you how he raised it. He <laughs> did, and I agree. Um, he raised it, and then to buy the furnishings inside, right. they had to raise something like six or seven hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> because I remember Harold McClure, the oil man from Alma, was in charge of raising that money. But he said, I want to give you this nice home. Okay? Never did think it was very nice, actually. And then, well, we had all of this oriental artwork and everything, and so they had to raise almost a million dollars, if I recall, for the, the inside. Well, they finally got the governor's residence. And so, um, Millick, or Romney was the first governor to live in the residency. And then, of course, um, Milliken lived in it, and then Blanchard, and uh, we're up now to Engler. And uh, that's how we had a governor's residence. Before that, there was no official residence. We never provided official residence. And that's one of the benefits that we provide for the governors today. It's just one of those things that we provide that you can argue back and forth. Now, if you go, it used to be you could drive right up, go up and knock on the door and say, hello, how are you? Anyone home? Major to answer, somebody to answer. Now, there's a state police post there, 24-hour guard. And there's a big fence around it now, and you have to have a key to get in and all of this. Um, it's really funny, you know, being from Montana, and being, you know, with Michigan, when the governor travels, he always has a minimum of two state police with him as he travels about. Uh, the governor of Montana, um, it's really funny with Roscoe, uh, he, when he goes someplace, he drove one night, he drove from uh, Helena to Harrow, and you're talking about, oh, 100, uh, 200 miles, and he jumps in his car, in his little car, and drives up and stops and goes in, says, well, nobody with him, not even an aide or anything. I mean, totally a different way of life. If he ever had a state trooper with him or something, they'd look at him like he was crazy or something like that. But this is all part of it, because we're getting into this, the mayor of Flint, the mayor of Dearborn, uh, all have, you know, security and what have you. So we've seen a lot of changes, a lot of political changes uh, in the capital. We've seen the, the development. So many of our historic structures, of uh, Lansing structures, have been taken over by government uh, to build the complexes that we have in government. 
and government has gotten so large, and uh, we, we build such you know expensive structures for the carrying out of duties and what have you that we've lost so much of our history. And uh, it's funny nowadays when we talk about the politics of things that if you want to talk, we mean less government and less taxes, you know, and all that. And that word taxes is always a no-no word that we hear throughout throughout government. But you look at governors who have been in this city, and you look at the early history of Lansing as a city. Um, as a city politic, it really hasn't been overly exciting as a, as a politic, um, as a body, a political body. It's interesting that um, when, you, when you look at it, Lansing traditionally has always been a very conservative community. And you pro you couldn't elect a Democrat here in the 30s, you know, from all that period up, it was solidly Republican. Until you got in, you know, to the 30s, there was a dip. Then it was solidly Republican. Now, of course, you have a city council that two years ago, the last since Brockwell left, uh, there isn't a Republican on the city council at Lansing. Even though it's nonpartisan, it's made up of all Democrats. And I said to Hollister uh, one time, I said, well, Dave, you ought to be just happy as can be. What do you mean you want this, you know, the rain fee? They, you know, it's a rain tax that they call a rain fee. That will be decided by the Supreme Court, which is before them here in the state now. And uh, I said, why do you have these problems? These are all your people. I mean, what do you have the problems? He just grumbles and looks at me, you know, something like that. But it really is, uh, it's really been interesting on the mayors. But the mayors have never even, you know, been very forceful in running for public office. You know, they've been the mayor of the capital city, and that's a jumping off spot. In fact, uh, the Democratic candidate running for governor of New Mexico right now is former mayor of Albuquerque. And, you, you know, and uh, uh, Indiana's senator uh, is uh, the present senator from Indiana, the Republican senator. Um, Luger is a former mayor of Indianapolis, and so that's always been a kickoff. But in the state of Michigan, Detroit mayors, I mean, Al Cobo tried to make it, and we've never had really an effort that anyone who's run, who's been a Lansing mayor or an office, to go to higher office. And you know, I've never really figured out why, and it's really worked out. We've never, interestingly enough, had really uh, a congressman elected from Lansing who gained a lot of power in the Congress. And probably, in, on a contemporary basis, uh, probably Bob Carr, uh, who chaired the uh, House Appropriations Committee on Transportation. And I think even Engler hated to see him leave Congress because, I mean, Carr was just shoving in money left and right, and that's how the game is played. But I can't, I can't really think, um, unless I'm forgetting something, I can't recall any member of Congress that was a major key chair of a committee and it was a real powerhouse from Lansing. And it's, it's really been one of those enigmas on the whole political scene. Uh, I'm just trying to think, um, we've, had, uh, we've had a couple regions, but as I go through, uh, even state chairs of the Republican Party, it's really been something, but it's always been the seat of all the power of politics that we've ever had, as far as the capital city. And Lansing has certainly been that. And, uh, it's been interesting. We've had only te technically visitations. Uh, we have had in the city itself, if I'm not mistaken, we've only had one president who visited the city of Lansing while serving as president. Unless you want to include Theodore Roosevelt, he came to East Lansing and then came, maybe came up Michigan Avenue and hit the city of Lansing on that, on that basis. But I don't think Gerald R. Ford came to Lansing, even our own president, during the, the short period of time that he was president. And then, of course, Clinton you know, came to the university and um, spoke there and then came to talk about education and the capital in the chambers. Prior to that, of course, we've had you know, Eisenhower spoke at the Constitutional Convention. Glenn, were you there that day? Yes. When Eisenhower came? And he spoke, and then Ford came to Lansing a few times after he was out of the office of president. And so he did, he did make that kind of appearance. But we didn't really, uh, in fact, when JFK, uh, John F. Kennedy is another one, I don't think, that one of his few trips he ever made to Michigan was when he went to Mackinac Island. He came to Kalamazoo. Yeah, he came to Kalamazoo, but he came to Mackinac Island his very first time as a candidate. He was a candidate, 
Uh, and he came up to get Williams' blessing, and, you know, on that basis, you know, that uh, Gene Manning Williams uh, to run. And uh, Governor Swainson, whom a lot of us in this room know, <coughs> the first governor in the United States to come out and officially endorse Kennedy for nomination for president of the United States. And um, um, anyway, this was uh, it's kind of the, the setting of Lansing as it started out, uh, very, very political. Uh, you had uh, all the activities centered around Lansing and what have you. Not that there hasn't been much of a negative thing uh, come about except for Pingree. But um, uh, I do want to mention to Mr. Turner over there that the only thing is, is that when the Republicans gained control of the state when they first ran, they founded in Jackson in 1854, and the first candidate was Kingsley S. Bingham. And the Republicans were 100% winning every year, except they lost in 1882 or 4 to Begole, but he ran as a fusionist. But the Democrats never again won until they beat James M. Turner. And in, 19, see, that would have been 1890. And that's when the Democrats, and he was defeated by a gentleman down at, uh, from Hamburg, Michigan. And um, that was the first time. But I like the way he's defined, uh, Turner, a Lansing railroad mogul. That's how he was, de how he was defined uh, when he ran. So we did have a candidate run for governor from Lansing. And he was, uh, uh, the issues were such um, uh, that it just didn't work out for him. So all in all, from a, a political standpoint, um, Lansing has been unique, uh, certainly more famous for a real car company than anything else. And um, as far as politics, and as you know, historically, uh, we have lost, um, when I mentioned earlier that Lansing is one of the most uh, unhistoric capitals, I mean it in the sense, too, of structures that are left. Uh, we never had a real key interest in saving. Uh, one of our neighboring congressmen, who was kind of an interesting person, except when he gave a speech, uh, was Al Bentley from Owasso. And I remember when I first moved to Michigan, you guys, it was about 1963. And they were, there was a big drive to raise money to move REOs home. And I recall that they had raised that, they needed $60,000 to, to move it, if I recall at that time. And the Bentley Foundation gave 30. And they needed the other 30,000. And they couldn't get it, and so they tore it down. REO's home. And uh, it's, it was sort of the thing. Oh, another little aspect is the Lansing State Journal. Do you know that uh, the name of the Lansing State Journal was the Lansing State Republican? Why? The um, Clinton County, or the Eaton County newspaper of Charlotte, it used to be called the Charlotte Republican. St. John's was the Clinton County Republican. Now, do you guys know why? Anybody know why? When the, when the Republic, what always followed a movement were new paper, newspapers. When the Reparty, Republican Party was founded, newspapers then developed to promote the new party, the new philosophy. And that's when these papers all became. These were all Republican instruments. They were all Republican <coughs> instruments and were used to promote the new Republican Party. Well, it's times changed, you know. Now I've got too political. We got rid of that name, you know. In fact, uh, the first newspaper in the state was the Detroit Free Press. The second one was Ann Arbor News, and the third one was Kalamazoo Gazette. But the two newspapers, the big ones, were the Democratic paper, the Detroit Free Press, and uh, the Republican paper, the Detroit Appetizer. And that was a statewide so-called circulation, probably got as far as Howell. And, um, but these papers, they didn't distribute them much out of town. And it was kind of interesting that Lincoln, in that campaign, when you go to research some of the, some of the stuff, Lincoln would, um, the Detroit paper would say, Lincoln made a point here where he did this. Um, Kalamazoo is the best one. Lincoln coming to Kalamazoo, the Detroit advertiser, had a front page picture, not pictures, didn't have pictures at that point. Great big story about Lincoln, Lincoln coming to Kalamazoo and what have you. The Free Press, page 32, little article. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln from Illinois, and the first while a congressman is coming to speak you know, in Kalamazoo. And uh, they were very political. Newspapers have always been the most political 
thing you can imagine. They always took positions and what have you. And even to this day, you know that you know, the best money that you can spend today is to, on Saturday or Sunday, particularly Sunday, to buy the Detroit News and Detroit Free Press. Because you can, at one shot deal, you're getting the philosophies of the Republican and Democratic uh, parties. The Detroit News is rock ribbed Republican, and the Detroit Free Press. So if you want to hear, if you want to read about editorials on endorsements and things like this, get opposite views by getting the two papers, and they're very, very partisan. State Journal at one point was. Now it's very difficult to determine. Um, they usually check who's the winner, and uh, <laughs> then, then try to pick that one as best they can. And if it's a lot of Republicans, always throwing a few Democrats. If it's a lot of Democrats, well, we're throwing a Republican over here. We don't want to look. You know, we don't want to look like we're being political. So, <coughs> excuse me, times have changed a great deal on that. But the newspapers went through a whole process. And we used to have, as you know, a ton of newspapers. <coughs> excuse me, England County News used to be a major paper and still has circulation around, but there were probably six papers in the county. They were very big. People loved newspapers. And they would take papers and they would... That's why, you know, the tradition has always been of the, the impact of the weekly paper. Because, you know, the daily papers are so thick, people didn't have time. You go to the rural area and you sell a, uh, you buy a weekly paper. That weekly paper is with you all week. I mean, people don't throw it away. They keep that paper until the next week's paper comes out. And so that was why you had so many newspapers. But then we started going to a daily. And if you can imagine how we have changed from that time to USA Today, that is becoming so successful. And here it is a national newspaper that goes out. And if you notice, do you remember the first one that the issues came out? It used to be a thin little paper like this. My gosh, now, you know, it's got a hundred pages almost. You know, the thing's thick and everything else. It has all kinds of things. But the newspaper, the genesis of newspapers starting out was that they're very, very political. And they have, and you know, when we talked about uh, Grosbeck, I remember when Grosbeck came on a campaign tour. He came up from Detroit, and he was going out hitting these areas. And what, what made politics one of the most interesting things versus how we see politics being played today, people would go, they were going to announce, for example, Grosbeck. He came to Lansing, and he gave a little bit of a speech, looked out and pulled the little curtains on his car, didn't like the crowd too much, wasn't a very good turnout. He said, I don't know if we should stop or not. He got out and gave a very short speech, but his big thing was to go to Owasso to give a big speech over there. And you go for the day. You know, when you had politics in the early years, you went for the day. And even prior automobiles, you would take the carriage, and it was always usually in the county seat. They tried, uh, they tried to get county seats kind of in the center of the counties. That's what they tried to hit. That's why you have such unique names. Marshall instead of Battle Creek, Mason instead of you know Lansing, and then Kalamazoo is in the center. So. But that's what they, they tried to do. And people would come, horse and buggies, and they would, uh, they would come in. And uh, uh, one of the, the things that's so interesting when they would come in uh, is that they planted for the day. And they would stay for 10 to 12 hours. A candidate had something to say, would get up and speak for three hours. And people were excited about it because you know getting communication, finding out about the differences. My God, you can't get 10 seconds on television for anybody to listen today. You know, I've heard too much, you know, this type of thing. And uh, so it's hard to get it. Uh, it was interesting. We've had some fantastic presidential things, I think, hit here. The whistle-stop trains, one I have very definite personal interest in. But Roosevelt came, and he stopped. And he, his stop was over at uh, Clarence, where Clarence is. That's the train station that Roosevelt stopped. And those were the famous whistle stop campaigns. And I'm not sure, I don't, I don't think Truman came through Lansing. I think this was one that he missed. Truman, I think, went the southern route to Jackson when he went out. But uh, Roosevelt had a very successful whistle stop train. The favorite one, because I came up with the idea, I love you. And that was the one uh, for Gerald R. Ford in 1976 that we had the whistle stop train. And um, I had proposed three things, because Ford was not doing well, if you recall. And it was Lansing, the Lansing trip. And this, we would be proud of that for history, turned his campaign around. Because if you recall, when Ford started out, he was running this wimp campaign. And he got into Texas, lost all of the votes. Remember, he lost Florida. Then he lost everything in Indiana. 
after we had the famous meeting they called the Mother's Day Massacre, we met at the airport, and they said, what three things can we do to perk up you know, Ford's campaign in the state? He's going to lose Michigan. And I said, let's do three things. This a little pipsqueak. You know, I said, let's do three things. I said, number one, let's do a train to Michigan. And I'd gotten the idea, because I was a staff director for the delegation, the staff director for the delegation of the Kansas City Convention. And so McLaughlin and I took off one day, went over to Independence. And I'm sitting in this little cubicle, and here is the story of Truman's 1948 Give Him Hell Harry campaign trip by train. I thought, yeah, the time is right to do that, because it hasn't been done. I said, I just thought to myself, we got to do it. So I came back and said, let's do the train. And I said, we, uh, you ought to go over to the Holland Tulip Festival, where he's familiar in that area. That's third biggest event in America today. You guys know that? Second only to the Rose Bowl and the Mardi Gras, the Holland Tulip Festival. Try to get a room in Lansing. <clears throat> um, can you imagine people coming all over, just people looking at tulips? <laughs> I remember old Bill Wickers, Mr. Holland, the last guy to bring in the windmill into Holland. I'll never forget it. We'd go over for a history commission meeting, and I, I'd bend down and say, hey, Bill, I'm going to pick one of these. And he just about died on the spot. And uh, But they had big fires. You know, this is a big thing. I couldn't believe they'd do that. And I said, then visit a Ford plant. I'll never forget the two White House staff guys. I said, well, that's not being presidential. And I said, you're right. What he ought to do is continue being presidential. Well, they selected all three of them. They did all three. So they let me run the presidential train. And I wanted to do it from Port Huron. And uh, we actually started from Flint. And we went across the state. And you know the impact of a whistle stop train? In fact, I had this guy come up to me, and I liked him because he was about my size. He says, you know, Chairman McLaughlin said, this was your idea. He said, I want to tell you, it's the greatest idea I've ever seen. As we're pulling out Lansing, this guy, in the Walter Cronkite, he thought it was great. We had 175 media. The next day, this is on a Saturday, the next day, the front page of the Lansing State Journal, only one thing that wasn't about Ford's whistle stop uh, train was a little, the little index down in the left-hand corner. What page thing was wrong? He got coverage all over this country. You couldn't pay it. The train, when we started out, I called uh, Burdekin with the Grand Trunk, because I had done some stuff with them. And uh, how much of this cost? So we can get your train to go from Flint uh, down to uh, Niles. And it'll be $5,000. Well, you know, this is back in 76. And by the time, that you just don't do that, you know. You have to have a sweeper engine to go before the engine. Then you have to have an engine and back of the train to protect anything coming up. So that $5,000 effort cost $250,000, which you know, was a lot of money back then. But you couldn't, you must have got, we must have got $10 million in free publicity. But I'd arranged, this, these are the fun Lansing stories that you get into. We had to figure out, we're going to have a luncheon. We're going to have it. John McGough from the Panex newspapers. So we're going to have this big luncheon. And it's going to be at uh, the train station. Remember the restaurant over there on South Washington? You know, if you notice, uh, it's closed now again. But there was a history marker inside. It's the only marker we ever had in Michigan. I got that shoved through the history commission when they were sleeping. That has a lot, the name of a living person on our history marker for Michigan. And it was Ford stopped here. Well, it was a classic event. <coughs> People were all over it. Vince Malconji owned the restaurant at that point. And we had all the editors and Ford. And my God, he took the chair for it, sat in the dishes and everything, and made a shrine almost for all of those things. But one of the cute stories is that when you deal on a presidential visit, Secret Service are very, very interesting. See, they could care less who you are. I can remember my two most memorable days. Here's Griffin standing up there, hopping up and down. Jerry, Jerry, I can't get in. Will you clear me? And I thought right there I had that power. Maybe I will, and maybe I won't. <laughs> Jerry, if you know what's good for you, you will. Come along, Senator. <laughs> and the other one, it was when Ford made the famous announcement at the University of Michigan when he announced for president. There was one guy that could not get in. And of course, I'm running off my little secret, because I always, you know, when you're on staff, you do a lot of coordinating. And this guy by the name of Tom Ford couldn't get in. He says to the Secret Service, I'm the president's brother. Too bad. You have a badge, <laughs> you know, or something. And so I, can, I had the, they gave me the part to clear, you know, if I could identify myself. So that was, those are two that really neat stories, you know, the one that's Lansing. But the presidential visit, um, when he was campaigning, 
So that would probably, that would have been the time Ford came here as president. Because he was running for president. Remember, he had become president you know, on that basis. Nixon had resigned in 74, <coughs> so he was running for election. So that's the other time. That would be the other president who did come through Lansing. So anyway, those are just some of the stories of Lansing. And, uh, it's, been, it's been really a unique time. It's, uh, um, we've never, in recent years, uh, we started holding with new convention center. Uh, we started holding uh, state party conventions here. Uh, there was a real gap for years because it was traditional that we always, it was just traditional, it's Grand Rapids one year, Detroit the next, Detroit, Grand Rapids, back and forth, Democrats the switch and all that. Then we started moving, the Republicans went to Kalamazoo, the Democrats went once, then we started coming back to Lansing for political party conventions. Facilities have not been the best here. You've got all the facilities because you need caucus rooms and stuff, but the new Lansing Center has made a real difference of attracting the political party conventions. So you'll probably see more of them in the future. So anyway, those are just a few comments, remarks, and if you want to bring something up or discuss it, that would be fun. Or if you have anything, hot on your minds. Okay. Thank you. Bob. Now you can ask questions. I wanted. To well, I wanted Bob. Ought to say something. This guy was, was a premier lobbyist for years in Lansing. Did a lot of lobbying, and of course, Judge Allen ran Lansing for many years. As a military budget director, uh, there are very few stories I can tell in mixed company, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jerry, put the time of this home being built, 1853, right? And our capital was what year did they build the present? Well, they started the building of it 1847. That's when they moved the site and they started uh, building. They probably started in 1846, started getting that. And what are they came out of Detroit? Pardon me? Came out of Detroit? Yes. What year? 1847. Okay. Yeah, 1847 is when the capital officially moved. It was there 10 years, 1837, 47. And at that time, even when this Elgin home was built, it was considered a city in the forest and a lot of... Yeah, everything developed afterwards, pretty much. You might have had some spot, you know, things here, but it was, they had to literally clear the trees out for the capital. And that's how it got that name. And they had, they, they were, you can see pictures if you go down the lights, you know, library, you can see pictures of, of uh, planks, boards that people walked on and stuff like this. And the housing was atrocious. They didn't have. And so they came up and stayed just a short time. They stayed with families, you know, farmers in the outside, the areas outside and stuff mm -hmm. like this. And almost and like locking too, right? Pardon me? It's almost like locking. Yeah, because they did a lot, you know, uh, not so much in this particular area, but at one point there was a lot of logging, you know, immediately. And there's a book, Jerry, I actually have called City in the Woods. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting. And when you read the book, the names will start popping up that you know. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just from the local people around here, where their history came from. It's a very interesting book. Just only this thick, too. I just got that, too. Mm -hmm. City in the Woods. I have one of the originals. Mm -hmm. what, what year was the university established? When did it, it was... Uh, 1855. 55, but it was Michigan State... College, their Michigan Agricultural College. Michigan and Agricultural, just a tiny. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. When it when it was, was land grant, right? It was land grant, and um, kind of got a, I've got a letter of the congressman who introduced the bill for it. It's a guy out of the moral. East. Moral, isn't it? Pardon? Isn't it moral? Yes, <coughs> moral. I have a letter from Moral uh, talking about that point about uh, the setting of a college. I don't know where I got it, but somehow I got it. It was from Moral. It was, it was the guy that did that. So between the university then and actually was not the, the old, old yeah, land industry, right. which made, made Lansing actually start to grow into that the city. Was, yeah, the big thing. A little and you know, the first thing the government did, by the way, the first thing the legislature did, was to set aside all of that land right across from where all the churches are. They set aside that land for churches. That's why you have that big row of churches going down. Right here on Island mm -hmm. Street. Yeah, the legislature set aside that light mm -hmm. and for that for that purpose, you know, when they set it aside. And um, um, you know, I'll tell you an interesting story about our enemies of the South. You guys, anybody here, do you know how the University of Michigan was formed? 
this is the damn story you ever hear. And it was, uh, they, were, they were started in 1837. There was a Catholic priest by the name of Gabriel Rochard, who was a Salpician, a Salpician. And uh, he was at St. Anne's, which is St. Anne's down in Detroit, the second oldest Catholic parish in America, next to St. Augustine, the Catholic parish. And Gabriel Richard and a Presbyterian minister from Frenchtown Township, which is now called Monroe, and you even have a Frenchtown Township outside of Monroe, <coughs> John Monte, who founded, he was the first Presbyterian minister in the state. And that church, the additions and everything, stands in Monroe. By the way, that's where Custer got married, it was in that church. And uh, married Libby Bacon, the daughter of Judge Bacon. And, uh, it's really interesting because Mont, uh, it was Richard had seven, Monteith had seven letters, and Richard had six, and they founded in 1833 or 34, they founded a school for Indian boys and girls. And then it grew and they started including other people. They moved it from Wayne County to Ann Arbor and they changed the name to the University of Michigan. It was founded by a Catholic <coughs> priest and a, and a Presbyterian minister. And you know, when you go down there, Richard Hall, Monteith Hall, those are the carryovers, and that's how that university started. So one was a land grant, and one was started, you know, on, on a different, very different basis. And um, I would have So Lansing has, and you know, and it's nothing negative on it, but Lansing, as a historical community, um, you know, and it, uh, all these areas pretty much were formed, you know, Delta Township, all in the 18, you know, middle 1830s, early 1830s, that's primarily, you know, when they got the influence. And, but it's really kind of interesting because it was centered on the university, and it was centered on the capital, but other than that, as far as great history, it really isn't. You know, you know, I mean, you look at Marshall, you go down to Marshall, Michigan, you know, here you have all these pharmaceutical companies, you have all these various things going on and around, you know. But Lansing was, even though we did have, if I'm not mistaken, we had 14 cigar companies at one time. There were 14 cigar companies here, and I think that's probably because we had so many politicians. <laughs> I can't think of another reason, but I sort of figured on that one. Yeah. But why do we have the power then? Just because it's the capital? Is it like nonpartisan? No, it's because just the capital. Because there's no politics. I mean, there's so much politics, but what is the strength mm. to, make, to make us have so much power? Oh, well, the big big strength is, number one, you're the head of the seat of government. You have a major university, but you've also got goals will be And remember, at one point, remember R.E. Olds, you could really consider the uh, father of the automobile. And Rio was the, was the basis. Remember when he moved it down to Detroit, burned down, and he came back. And that developed into a, uh, a real power base. And that's why, see, Oldsmobile, the reason they didn't want to, they, Oldsmobile has no connection to R.E. Olds. You realize that. There's no connection to R.E. Olds and Oldsmobile, two different companies, really, even though one germinated from the other. But they didn't really, Oldsmobile always downplayed R.E. Olds. And the only time they really recognized it is when we did that history marker. Oh, there was a great Lansing story. We did that history marker, 90th, and if that wasn't one of my most fun days, and then with the 100th anniversary, we highlighted our audience. Got to tell you guys the damn story. Remember the chairman of the board, General Motors? The chairman of the board was uh, Smith? Roger, Roger. Roger Smith. Remember? Had no personality. You know, he, Grumble like this. Not too much business acumen. You no, know, he was, and he was bean counter too. And he couldn't count the beans right. Well, guys, I had so damn much fun never left. You know, we see politicians. You know, you see the president move and all these little, you know, companions running around little aides. I dedicated two history markers with the cardinal. No one's ever done that. And uh, you have all kinds of bishops and little bishoprics and all these little people running around and priests. I got to tell you, when Roger Smith <coughs> comes to town, you've got everybody at his little. Feet. And they're yes, so you be up like this. And I'll never forget when he came. He was coming for that the special thing, 90th anniversary Oldsmobile. We're going to dedicate a history marker over there. You know where that is? In front of the former office building, the last of the Oldsmobile employees, now all GM. So <laughs> it's really a funny thing. I go over there. Are four people on the program. They got four on the program, but 
prior to his coming, you guys, prior to his coming, they painted the building, put an all new sod in front of the building. They perked that place up like you can't believe. The chairman is coming. And I didn't realize, you know, hell, it's only 90 miles, but he doesn't go out and visit these places, you know. And so when the chairman comes to town, that's big potatoes. So they set up this big head table. Four people on the program. Myself, as president of the State History Commission, I'm going to dedicate the markers. Bill Lane, who was general manager of Oldsmobile, and Roger Smith, and Bowles Anderson. Bowles gets up and says something on behalf. We're all standing down below, and I'm sitting there, and guys, I do all this stuff, tongue in cheek. I just think it's so damn much fun. I said, uh, Roger, I think we ought to get this program going. What do you think? Yeah, Jerry, sure, that'd be good, you know, something like this. Okay, come up, you come up here. You sit over here, and I'll sit there by you. And Bill, you sit here, and uh, nobody was, everybody has been important, and they haven't made the arrangements. See, I was seating him and all this. Now, Bill, you probably want to go through and introduce it and all this. Yeah, okay, fine, we got that. And here are all these PR guys that pass paper and everything else. So we're sitting like this, Roger Smith and myself here, and I knew where to sit, by the way, had not having been in politics and been growing up dumb. And over here, Bill Lane and Old Anderson. And I went like this. Hey, Roger. Because all the TV cameras, all the photographers and stuff are sitting there taking pictures of Roger Smith, and I'm like this. And I'll never forget, I said, Roger. And I called him Roger. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I didn't know anything. And I said, have you noticed all the publicity you're getting sitting next to me? <laughs> he starts laughing. And God, that's just like, an earthquake hit Oldsmobile, you know. <laughs> Roger Smith does not laugh. I'll tell you right now, he isn't about to laugh. He sat there and he kept laughing. And he said, that's a good one, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a good one. And he said, now we have to take the car, we gotta go down, we gotta ride up the steps of the Capitol in this 1980 wheel. And he had to something, he said, I want you to be on the bus with me. I said, pardon me? I didn't want to go on the bus with me. And I said, okay. And so off I go, and I'm sitting and telling him stories and boring the hell out of him, you know, he was a good sport. And so we get there, and he invited me to sit at the table with those guys, with Lane and all those guys, and here I am, the little interloper, you know. But <laughs> you know, no one would ever have said something like that to Roger Smith, you know, because he just didn't have it. And that's what's so much fun about it. When we dedicated a Catholic church over in St. Clair, we had a cardinal. Shock us the same way, you know. He was somebody else that never smiled. And I get up to dedicate the marker, and I said, by the way, it's sure great to have the cardinal here, and I see your assistance. This was a week before the Pope was coming. And you know how tickets were supposed to scare us and all this thing? And I see that uh, the Cardinal has these assistants here. Uh, Cardinal, is it safe to say that what you have in those um, in those valises, those, those suitcases, are those tickets you're going to hand out to everyone here at this event? <laughs> Why? First of all, I thought the bishops would all fall right over. <laughs> and you know, and of course he goes, ah, you know, I, I just sort of like this. We go inside, just like Roger Smith. Very funny, very funny. This is the Cardinal. <laughs> So, but they're all, people are people, and it's so much fun, and uh, it's just great. The Lansing is, is interesting, you've had a lot of political things, you've had a lot of things happen here, but it's, it's never been the real sexy kind of a capital thing, you know, uh, where you had a uh, shoot up of the capital or, you know, something like that, basically. It's been fairly mild. Glenn, what do you have to add about all this? You were up here for a year. Well, check me on this. <clears throat> well, while well, Lansing, as you say, has never had a um, native son become a uh, governor, uh, Lansing almost did, and wasn't the almost person who did, the per a person who lived in this house. James Turner built this house in around 1853 or 1850. Yeah, he lost in 1890. And he, and he had seven or eight children. And one of his children, well, his most famous child, I think, turned out to be his daughter, Abby, who then married Dodge. That's why this became Turner Dodge. But he had a son, James M. Turner, who ran for governor. Yeah, he lost eight. And he lost very narrowly. Five thousand votes. And I don't remember, 1880-something. 1890. 1890, all right. So while we didn't get it, we almost got it, and the almost got it fellow lived here. <laughs> so that, that boy was raised in this house then? Mm -hmm. was he, he was probably raised. He probably was raised in this house. Yeah. So that's he was got it. <laughs> You can imagine, you know, here's something to think about Turner Dodge House. 
Can you imagine the governors and the people that have been here? Because you know, being you know a very prominent family, that you know that they would have been here for dinner. And I wish we had that in our history somewhere. Who had come here? But I, I bet you tons of you know important people yeah. have visited here. And by the way, as a sidelight, and then we'll end up and go get some donuts or punch some. Let me just tell you the story. Some of you are old enough to remember. Do you recall? I, just, I show this film to my classes all the time. Do you ever, have you ever recalled the radio priest? Yes. Sure. Charles E. Coughlin, mm -hmm. Detroit. Yeah. You know, that guy was an incredible story, you know, because he affected everybody in Lansing, what have you. Russ Limbaugh boasts an audience of about 26 million people. Coughlin used to get at 4 o'clock. Remember, the vote was 167,000 to 11,000 of radio listeners called in, should it be the New York Philip Marnick, or should it be Coughlin, and that was the vote. And at 4 o'clock on Sundays, good afternoon, my friends, you know, that kind of thing. Well, Coven, as you know, had 40 million people in the 30s, and he had quite a movement. Only reason I say it is just follow suit with all the craziness that I do all the time. Uh, I went down and spent uh, five hours with Coven, about seven weeks before, seven weeks before he died. And it was about the greatest seven hours. I mean, it was incredible. Can you imagine? Am I talking to someone and am I not getting a word in? <laughs> I mean, it was fascinating, you know, story. And I just looked around, you know, and say, well, there's somebody, you know, call him up and meet him. You know, that's, you're going to find that most all of these people that you're, we talk about that are important stuff are as not, the majority, you get a few jerks, but the majority of these people are just as nice as can be. I mean, they're, they've been there, and usually successful people are, will give them their time, they'll do a lot of things. And it's usually the phone, you know. And one of the things that, you know, I did went around looking at all the governor's graves and stuff, and you cannot believe it, the governors that never made it, the candidates, great big monuments like this, you know. And um, they're really dynamite people, you know, and they have little markers, you know, something like this, with, with exception. But the ones who ran and never made it, great big monuments, you know, it's classic. I'm not sure, how tall is uh, James Turner's? Pretty tall. <laughs> he's buried out. He's buried out. One of the, one of the tallest. He's, he's buried out. Uh, oh, Mount Hope. Yeah. 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 He's buried out there. That's a great story. Well, though. Actually, actually, James M. Turner is the tall, tallest. Yeah. That's James yeah. Turner, the elder. His, he has a different yeah. monument out there. I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> but I'll tell you, history is fun, and it's fun in Lansing. It's fun all over. And as you know, I spent a lot of time looking up going for it. So, so the Turners were the first families that really settled here. No. The large. One of the first, there were, there were several here. Because of Lansing was nothing who came to settle here. Well, right. well, the Turners came here from Mason oh, okay. in, in 47. Were there not settlers from Lansing, New York? When oh, yeah, mm -hmm. sure, a lot, a lot of yeah. New Englanders. Because if you remember, you look around us guys. Uh, if you look around, Vermontville, mm -hmm. you know, Charlotte, and you look at these, these uh, uh, towns, that are all around. And Geneva, I don't know if she remembers this, but I think Geneva wasn't. Well, I remember. But <laughs> Geneva, wasn't uh, Potterville named, wasn't Potterville, for this Potter. For Potter Park, who gave Potter Park his Potterville? His son. He yeah. gave it in, name, in memory of his, his father. His son, James. Yeah, that's okay. That's, that was that. But boy, you, I mean, there is so much. I mean, you know, Michigan is such the history. Um, I mean, you can you can look at it. You know, we're one. Uh, we're one of the cabinet counties. You knew that. <clears throat> Mich uh, Lansing, Ingham County is one of the cabinet counties. Cabinet. Cabinet. And there were a group of counties that when we first tried to become a state, if you'll notice something that's interesting on Michigan, that we became a state in 1837, didn't we? Right. Why, did we why did we celebrate our centennial in 1935. Oh, because we acted as a, as a state and had a representative. Territorial. Territorial. But, right. what, that, but why? That's not a centennial statement. No. But that's what the stamp says. The sesquicentennial stamp is 1987. And the reason for that was pure politics, that we were all set to go in. We were opposed by, we were opposed primarily, we started out being opposed uh, by Indiana and Ohio because of electoral votes. 
you know, you have Van Buren's election coming up and all that. And so what they did is when they, they opposed coming in, they gave it credit. They said, okay, well, we're a state. Michigan had passed our being a state, but we hadn't been introduced yet. The gentleman who was the supporter that introduced the resolution for Michigan to become a state and could only do it after Arkansas became a state because that was the trade-off. The, remember the, free, the slave versus the free state? And the guy that opposed Michigan overwhelmingly was Daniel Webster. Absolutely opposed it. Our, the guy that introduced our reservation, or resolution was uh, Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri. Made Michigan a state. But that's one of the, the real interesting quirks of our stamp. That's yes. Benton Harbor. Or named Benton Harbor, named after him, perhaps? Yes, yes, after Benton. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And you know, the other thing that's, that's kind of interesting on that, uh, when you look at that, that whole state, would, remember the Toledo War, and we had all that kind of nonsense trying to decide you know, who's going to get stuck. Remember back then, stuck with the Upper Peninsula? That ice barren area, because we wanted Toledo. Because remember, Toledo, you know, and remember in 1805, the populations in 1805 was something like Detroit, 550. Um, Toledo was 2,000. That's when Ohio went into the Union, Yep. 1805. Yep, uh, 18, five or six, yep, right in there. Then Fort Dearborn had 167 people. Now, where's Fort Dearborn? Chicago, you got yeah. it. That was never the metropolis because of the Erie Canal. The metropolis was supposed to be Toledo, and they all were thinking ahead of time, you know, this ought to be the big place, never quite made it. And uh, so it's kind of, uh, it's interesting, and then we had that little spat with Toledo, you know. Only casualty was a pain. Nice talk.